The police department of America's largest city is accused of spying on innocent people going about their daily lives. Officials say it's what's required to keep everyone safe. But most of the people being targeted say their rights as Americans are being violated. So who's right? I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. Many Americans were shocked to learn that the NYPD has been carrying out a secret surveillance program in Muslim communities in New York and New Jersey for years in the aftermath of the September 11th terrorist attacks. According to an extensive investigation by the Associated Press, the Demographics Unit, a secret squad within the New York Police Department, deployed undercover officers. They were of Arab descent. They were sent into Muslim neighborhoods in New York City and New Jersey. Once there, they photographed mosques and cataloged the places where Muslims congregate. This included restaurants, grocery stores, internet cafes, and bookstores. At mosques, police recorded license plates and took photos and videos of worshipers as they arrived for services. Informants and undercover officers, called rakers, helped police record and keep files of innocuous sermons. The undercover officers eavesdropped inside businesses owned or operated by even second and third generation Arab Americans and filed daily reports on the activities and conversations of the owners and their customers. The NYPD also infiltrated Muslim student organizations at universities far beyond New York City, including the elite Ivy League colleges of Yale and the University of Pennsylvania. And they monitored the websites of Muslim student groups, keeping files on how many times students prayed each day and what they discussed on field trips and at gatherings on campus. There were no allegations of wrongdoing against the individuals being monitored, nor did police have any evidence that the places under surveillance were being used for any type of criminal activity. The NYPD and New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg have defended the surveillance program, saying that the goal was to carry out human mapping, a process of gaining a better understanding of the Muslim communities in and around New York to identify problem areas and prevent domestic terrorism. Everything the New York City Police Department has done is is legal, it is appropriate, it is constitutional. The NYPD's tactics have garnered widespread criticism from Muslim Americans and lawmakers who say that the communities were targeted solely because of the religion of the residents and not because there were any credible threats of terrorist activities. As mayor of this city, my immediate and urgent concern is the Muslim community here that should not feel or be victimized by law enforcement agents when you are singled out just because of your faith for, uh, for surveillance, for spying, for what have you, that strikes at the core, I think, uh, and I've talked to countless people about this this week, I think it strikes at the core of all of our feelings of what is right and just in the United States of America. So how far can law enforcement go to prevent terrorism? And does national security trump individual rights? Joining us now to offer some insight on these questions is counterterrorism expert and attorney David Gartenstein Ross. David, thank you and welcome for coming into the show. Is what uh, the NYPD did, as you see it, is it, was it an appropriate thing to do? Was it legal? Was it justified? What they were trying to do was uh, intelligence-led policing. Right, their, their major attempt was to understand uh, in New York City where might hotspots be, uh, places where you might have uh, extremists congregate that could be part of a future plot. Um, after 9-11, which killed 3,000 people in that city, um, there was a real effort to try to prevent something like that from ever happening again. And uh, part of what they did was took lessons learned from other terrorist attacks, uh, going, for example, to Madrid after the 2004 attacks there, going to London after uh, the July of uh, 2005 attacks that occurred in London. Uh, and what they saw in those plots was that you had certain clusters, you had hot spots, you had places where people congregated. Uh, so it was based really upon their findings from uh, other terrorist attacks. Um, look, there's a broad array of things here within this particular story, but I think when it comes to uh, the idea of intelligence-led policing and using information to try to police against something like a terrorist threat, that makes eminent sense, and I think that the NYPD was not acting in the wrong manner by doing so. I think one of the things that really uh, people are questioning, though, is the CIA, having somebody from the CIA involved, it kind of gives it kind of a nefarious look in a way, doesn't it? You know, CIA has experience doing so. You're having a model that looks just like the CIA 
and using that in the NYPD, that would clearly be inappropriate. I don't think there's anybody who questions that. Uh, but having some CIA expertise as a part of it, on its face, that's not something which I think is improper. Now, there's questions of how it's being implemented. It's possible that it's improper imitation, uh, but we, we don't have the information to draw that conclusion. Let me ask you about uh, human mapping. How, how widespread is this in law enforcement? Uh, it's not something that's used uh, it's not something that's used in a lot of places. You know, in L.A., for example, uh, they tried to do uh, human mapping uh, several years ago, and uh, as the plan came to light, there was an, an uproar about that, uh, and uh, the chief, Mike Downing, ended up uh, canceling their effort to do so. Um, it's something which is uh, fairly unique and fairly uh, new to use intelligence to try to map communities um, and the like. And it's something which I think there is justifiable controversy about. Let me, uh, let me look at some of these statistics and maybe get you to kind of talk about this. The FBI database that shows that between 1980 and 2005, only 6% of the terrorist attacks on U.S. soil were carried out by Islamic extremists. There was a much larger percentage by extreme left-wing groups and Latino gangs. But we don't hear how these uh, long-term sustained surveillance programs are targeting those groups. And, and I think this is one of the things that, that People are like saying, well, geez, you know, you're targeting a specific, um, a specific group. Um, what, would your, what would your response be to something well, like that? Let, let's look at New York City. I mean, one of the problems is that when you take those statistics, which are national statistics, um, they can't necessarily be distilled down to New York City. When we talk about Latino groups, um, you're primarily talking about Puerto Rican nationalist terrorist groups. Um, that's something which was a problem in Washington, D.C., for example. Puerto Rican nationalist terrorist groups are not a problem in New York City. Uh, if you look at major terrorist plots in New York City over the past 20 years, there are four of them, and all four have been Islamic extremist groups. In 1993, there was an attack on the World Trade Center. In 2001, of course, you had the 9-11 attacks. Um, subsequently, you had an, uh, a, a plot that targeted the JFK airport. And then finally, you had Faisal Shahzad, who uh, tried to detonate a bomb on Times Square and failed only because uh, he used the wrong kind of fertilizer. He uh, created the bomb improperly. So when you look at major attacks which could actually cause a large amount of damage in New York City, those have, o those have all been coming from Islamic extremists over the course of the past 20 years. Um, that's why I think it, it's important to look at the granular details of the city and the threats that the city faces. Let me, let me throw another statistic out and get your response to this too. Duke University, University of North Carolina, they had a study. They found 139 individuals have become radicalized inside the USA since 9-11. Okay, fewer than one-third of that group had successfully executed a violent plot and most of those were overseas. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, for one thing, um, there's clearly a competence gap amongst uh, homegrown terrorists. That's something that the Duke UNC study points to, and that's something which is absolutely correct. Um, a lot of the homegrown terrorist plots that we've seen, fortunately, uh, have been uh, planned by groups that, uh, or by individuals, who simply don't have the expertise to uh, properly carry out uh, what they're looking to do. And in cases where people have gotten far, um, like, for, for example, there's the uh, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, who uh, put a bomb inside his underpants, uh, quite infamously. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, the bomb didn't do what it was supposed to do, fortunately. Now, he wasn't entirely incompetent. Uh, after all, he was able to get this bomb on board an airplane, um, get it past the extensive security proce procedures that had been put in place post-9-11. That's something. But the incompetence of these terrorists, these homegrown terrorists, um, is something that certainly uh, is an advantage for us. You know, when you look back on our history, though, I mean, when you look back to the attack on Pearl Harbor, we yeah. saw the executive order from FDR, you saw Japanese living here in the United States going into internment camps. There, there's kind of this dark blotch on our history, and you can see why some people would be concerned that we may be shifting too far. Yeah, Don't I mean, you agree? Yeah, I mean, as I said before, that there are legitimate concerns and a legitimate debate to be had uh, about um, things like community mapping. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, as we look at the, the landscape of the future of warfare, I think the problem of terrorism writ large is not going to go away. And I think that we will actually see um, more competent terrorist groups that aren't Islamic groups emerge over the course of the next 10 to 15 years. I think that in all of these cases, um, it's important to use intelligence as opposed to not have information. Now, you can see from another corner how a different group felt that it was targeted and uh, had a backlash against that. That was uh, when DHS put out its report on right-wing extremists. And a lot of conservatives said, oh, this is stereotyping all conservatives. Now, what I can say there is that I didn't see the DHS report as being improper. 
I think understanding the beliefs of right-wing extremists is something that's entirely proper to do uh, for an agency like DHS. And there are, of course, some overlaps between right-wing extremist views and conservative views in general. Um, now, I can also understand why conservatives would be upset, but that's uh, you know, the same thing that's occurring within the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th th there's a fine line to draw, but when you come to a problem set where you could have thousands of people die at once, right. um, then it becomes a very serious question. Well, David, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for coming in and uh, visiting with us. Certainly appreciate it. My pleasure.